The Karate Kid is the greatest movie of all time, and anyone who says differently is either too easily influenced by silly internet videos, or thinking of the third one. <laughs> Today, I'm going to compare the 1984 original to the 2010 reboot, because I think the failings of the reboot can help illuminate what's great about the original. But first, a quick programming note. All the characters in the reboot have new names. In order to follow along, you'll need to keep in mind that in the reboot, Daniel is Dre, and Miyagi is Han, because we'll be comparing them directly a lot. But I don't think it's reasonable to expect you to remember that Ali is Mei Ying, Johnny is Chung, Dutch is Liang, Bobby is Drong, and Kreese is Lee. So for them, I'm just going to stick with the Federation standard 1984 nomenclature. Both movies set the story up the same way. A kid moves to an unfamiliar culture with his mother, meets someone who invites him to a ball game, spots a girl nearby, and exhibits some small skill to try to impress her. In the original, Allie tosses Daniel a soccer ball, and he juggles it. In the reboot, Dre strikes up a conversation with Allie, asks her what kind of music she likes, lies to her about their shared affinity for classical German composers of the Baroque period, Bah, I listen to them all the time, they're tight. Pulls out his phone to play her some different music, and then does this. In the original, it's organic. They're playing soccer, she throws him the ball, Daniel can do this neat thing with a soccer ball, boom, courtship. Dre just puts on some music and starts breakdancing. It's cringeworthy. Meeting Ali leads directly to the beach fight. In 1984, we see Johnny and Ali get in a heated argument for reasons unknown, a radio is abused, and Daniel butts in. Johnny reacts temperamentally, and then Daniel attacks him three times two bum rushes, and a sucker punch. Now, a few people may have some small disagreement with my interpretation of this scene, so let me be clear. Johnny definitely isn't being cool here. But neither the audience nor Daniel has any idea what transpired between Ali and Johnny before this moment. And not every guy who's being uncool needs to be violently stopped at all costs. So how does this play out in the reboot? Well, Johnny gets super aggressive super fast, and when Dre picks up Allie's papers, he just immediately catches a beatdown. No questions asked, no culpability on Dre's part, no second chances. There's no texture, no ambiguity, no layers at all to make the story interesting. Johnny is out of control and violent, and may attack at any moment, and so we must deal with it. Dre doesn't even land his sucker punch. Everything interesting or challenging about this scene is gone. By comparison, for all of Sensei Kreese's mercy is for the weak preaching, real Johnny is actually being extremely merciful here. I mean, he pushes him down in the sand. Again, not cool. But then he ignores Daniel's two bum rush attacks with no retaliation. These sidestep leg sweeps are textbook examples of minimum necessary force, and Johnny should be applauded for doing this in direct opposition to all of Sensei Kreese's teachings. What are you looking at? Finish him! He is trying to gently let this kid know that attacking him is a bad idea. And three times so far, he has broadcast that message without hurting Daniel. That is mercy. Stop it! I didn't do anything! This one just boggles the mind. We start with this perfect exchange between Daniel and Miyagi. What happened to I? Oh, I fell off my bike. Okay, no hurt the hand. One, two, two. In the reboot, that becomes... What happened to I? I ran into a pole. Interesting pole. What? Why? You took a simple, perfect thing and just ruined it. Like Britney Spears covering Joan Jett. You learn so much from this 12-word exchange. Lucky no hurt hand roughly translates to, I've been fighting my entire life, and I know what the aftermath of a beach brawl looks like, so don't try to put one over on me, kid, because I see into your soul, and I'm not the one because I will call you out on your bullshit, because you know you didn't fall off your bike, and I know you didn't fall off your bike, and now you know that I know, so don't try it again, because Daddy Miyagi only gives one warning, you heard? Okay, no hurt the hand. Interesting poll just means, interesting poll, I guess. He's suspicious, but being vaguely suspicious is not the same thing as disassembling someone's lie right in front of them. 
I can see into your soul. The power of this scene is in its simplicity. Daniel sees the school, and we know what he's thinking. He walks in, takes his time, sits down to take it all in, and boom. One of the greatest shots in all of cinema. Greg Toland, eat your heart out. I swear this is so inspired, they must have just been beside themselves when they thought of it. I don't know how they celebrated that night, but if it didn't involve Gary Busey, a cocaine white Lamborghini, and a man with three pagers named Dr. Feelgood, I will feel personally betrayed. The long lens in 1984 gives both a narrow field of view and a wifer theme depth of field that focus all your attention on this head-on, near point of view shot that is absolutely devastating as we see all of Cobra Kai students bowing to Johnny. It's claustrophobic, it's confrontational, and we feel Daniel's panic and embarrassment in this moment like a gut punch. By contrast, in 2010, we have a wider field of view, a wider depth of field, and the students are no longer as tightly grouped, so all the claustrophobia is gone. Johnny is smaller in the frame and isn't facing us, so it isn't as confrontational, and the students aren't even bowing to him anymore. Now he is bowing to someone else. How did they screw that up? Here again, the original scene is organic to the story, and it makes sense. Daniel is effectively in disguise, Johnny is effectively in a sensory deprivation tank, and Daniel is using a time delay fuse. In other words, he has plenty of reason to believe that he could actually get away with this. Dre apparently lifts a bucket that's heavier than he is, walks right up to the entire gang in the middle of the street, and drenches all of them with some sort of toxic sludge that probably violates the Geneva Convention. Any trace of this actually being a natural consequence of the story is long gone. The reboot just seems to be checking boxes off a list at this point. The unprovoked attack leads directly to the beatdown. In terms of the action, the original is really just a mediocre 80s fight scene where everyone waits their turn to attack and physics is entirely irrelevant. But we don't watch Karate Kid for the fight scenes, we watch it for the story. And this particular part of the story is compelling and perfectly executed. We start with a dark and scary night. We see Johnny getting a little bit unhinged. Well, now you're gonna pay. <laughs> Bobby speaks up for Daniel in a moment that sets up a payoff later. Leave him alone, man. He's had enough. And we culminate with a surprise rescue by Miyagi. It's dramatic, it's emotional, and it's powerful. In 2010, we get a brightly lit exterior at high noon. Bobby still tells him to lay off, and then it's Han to the rescue. Of course, the fight scene is better. It's Jackie freaking Chan, not Arnold from Happy Days. Come on, you guys ain't gotta butter me down! But it's also way longer, and it's played for comedy, so it loses all of its dramatic impact. Like, all of it. It's gone. And apropos of nothing, but isn't it interesting that Han goes to great lengths to not actually hit the children? I mean, he still dispenses a righteous beatdown, but he does it with the hands and the feet of the children themselves. The movie seems to be suggesting that skillfully redirecting the children's own aggression back at them is the gentle, merciful thing to do. You know, it's the thing a 21st century Miyagi would do. Now, where have I seen that before? I didn't do anything! Oh, right. This is the scene that first opened my eyes to the genius of this movie. Before I noticed this scene as an adult, it was just a silly 80s movie I liked when I was a kid. No better or worse than Cannonball Run, or Conan the Destroyer, or Break Into Electric Boogaloo. But when I finally saw this scene for what it is, it changed my whole perception of the film. As a kid, it seemed so simple. Miyagi is a secret badass who's not scared of anything. So he takes Daniel by the hand, they go in, they talk to the bad man, and they leave. It was one of the more boring scenes, really. But one day, it finally hit me. Miyagi is terrified. He puts on a good act, but gives it all away when he leaves by backing out of the studio. He doesn't trust Kreese any further than he could throw him, and he's not Spider-Man. He's not a super ninja. He's an old man, and this room full of teenage black belts and their sadistic teacher poses a real threat to him. You can tell he's terrified because his exit isn't smooth. Like if he looked slick somehow when he backed out, that would be one thing. You owe me $7, man. Yeah? What for? 
for teaching you how to dance, sucker. <laughs> but Miyagi don't moonwalk, and this is just awkward. But it's smart, and it's safe, and it shows us that Miyagi is not invincible. So I was super excited to see how they did this scene in the reboot. Obviously, I'm a bit of a Jackie Chan fan, and I was confident that he would add some new layer to this scene. Some gesture, some act of physicality, some nuance that only a person with a Jackie Chan's lifetime worth of experience as an actual martial artist could add. Instead, I got a scene that doubles down on Miyagi's fear, but utterly misses the point. Miyagi enters the dojo, sees the tournament poster, and makes the decision that that will be his end game for the negotiations. Han sees nothing upon entering. Miyagi weathers Kreese's repeated provocations without blinking. You don't come in my dojo and drop a challenge and leave, old man. Han runs away the moment Kreese challenges him. After Kreese agrees to his terms, Miyagi protects Daniel first, then remains vigilant as he exits to ensure their safety. Han is so frightened that he physically leans on a 12-year-old boy for emotional support, issues the tournament challenge out of sheer desperation, and immediately runs away, abandoning Dre altogether. I don't want to waste any time on this except to say, Check it off. Did anyone Check it off. ever Check it off. read this script out loud before they shot it? At least wax off requires a singular third person noun to make it dirty. Jack it off is a fully formed, grammatically correct, complete imperative sentence. Jack it off! Okay, Jackie, but I don't think that's gonna help his confidence any, do you? And I don't even wanna know what his finishing move is. It's a joke! <laughs> I get it! That's funny! <laughs> so, I don't usually enjoy big finale fight scenes. I tend to prefer the shorter, more direct action scenes that set stories in motion, like the market scene in Rumble in the Bronx, or the limo scene in The Last Dragon. I would not do that if I were you. Or the blood sport tournament in Ungbach. <laughs> or the big set pieces in the middle, like the garage scene in Thunderbolt, or the garage scene in Transporter 3, or the motel garage scene in Drive. I guess you might say a garage is a pretty good place to park your fight scene. Huh? Yeah? It's a joke! <laughs> but the All Valley Tournament is like a short film unto itself. You could start the movie at 1 hour 45 and understand the entire thing. It's the story of the triumph of Daniel and the simultaneous redemption of the Cobra Kai. But for some reason, the reboot left out half of that. Let's start with a quick rundown. The reboot gives Bobby's role to Dutch, so just bear with me on that. For simplicity, I'll use the Federation standard 1984 nomenclature for everyone. Daniel, Miyagi, and Ali arrive at the tournament. Dutch provokes Daniel in the locker room. Ali is nearly barred from entering the floor. Mr. Miyagi doesn't know the rules, which makes Ali a valuable asset because she does. Daniel competes in his first match and is issued a warning for running out of the ring. A musical fighting montage happens. Bobby seeks his sensei's approval. Daniel defeats a lesser Cobra Kai. Dutch refuses to bow. Daniel defeats Dutch. Johnny defeats the only dangerous non-Cobra Kai competitor. Sensei Kreese instructs Bobby to injure Daniel. Johnny begins to lose faith in Kreese. Bobby Dutch obeys and immediately regrets it. All the Cobra Kai begin to lose faith in Kreese. Daniel is told by the doctor that he may not continue. But Miyagi is a better doctor than the actual doctor. Daniel returns to face Johnny on the mat. Kreese orders Johnny to attack Daniel's injured leg. Johnny obeys. Daniel wins with a special move that he learned in secret. Johnny presents Daniel with his trophy. The reboot omits three short vignettes right from the start. Two are comic relief that also reinforce the outsider theme, and the third establishes Dutch as a secondary antagonist, possibly even more dangerous than Johnny. And that's what really kills me. They hobbled the story about the Cobra Kai kids. In 1984, there is a very clear story arc that happens over the course of the tournament. First, we establish Dutch as the most aggressive Cobra Kai. I mean, look at Johnny here. 
He doesn't even want to be there. Dutch is provoking Daniel, and Tommy is having the time of his life watching, but Johnny and Bobby over there just aren't even interested. And if you want to get film school on it, you should notice that the two groups are physically separated in the frame by Daniel himself. They are literally on opposite sides of the conflict with Daniel already. Next, we see Bobby looking to Crease, seeking his approval. So when we later see his revulsion at being asked to kneecap Daniel, we understand why he does it anyway. And having overheard that instruction, Johnny is throwing some serious side eye at Crease in every shot thereafter. He is not happy with the way this is going. Once Bobby does what he's asked despite his misgivings, he immediately regrets it. And afterward, we see the entire Cobra Kai crew rethinking their life choices. Anyway, none of this is in the reboot. The reboot gives Bobby's role in the tournament to Dutch for some reason. And so through Dutch, we do see his regret after the illegal technique. But we don't see Johnny ever questioning his teacher, and we never see an explicit instruction for either of them to hurt Dre, which makes them both much more complicit in the whole thing. All Johnny gets is a super vague no mercy, and Bobby Dutch goes full Tanya Harding with nothing more than a soulful glance from Crease. And they even include this shot where all of the children just completely ignore their crease. Like, if they wanted to show the children seeking Crease's approval so that we understand why they do what they do, this would have been a great spot to do it. But nope, not a single one of them even glances in his direction. And then at the end, we inexplicably get this over-the-top grand gesture where the whole school seems to spontaneously reject Crease in favor of Han. According to Wikipedia, this is literally them firing Crease and accepting Han as their teacher. Which, among other things, seems a bit presumptuous. But since the reboot never laid any of the groundwork about these guys losing their faith in Crease, this ends up looking like Han's kid won the tournament, and now they just want to be allied with the winner. There's no redemption here because they haven't learned anything. So basically, the original Karate Kid tells the story of not just one, but a group of young boys growing up and learning that not all mentors are created equal, and whom you choose to trust can have a profound impact on who you become. The reboot tells only about Dre's journey, and then tacks on a manufactured ending for a redemption story that it never bothers to tell. So that's all I got. Please click all the buttons you see in front of you so the algorithms will know to prioritize my videos over those of others in the future. Thank you. Finish him. And then he's all